So today we speak with Carlos Alvarenga. He is a communication researcher, writer, and coach whose latest book, The Rules of Persuasion, explores the intricacies of persuasion across diverse mediums. With a rich background in management, consulting, and academia, Carlos brings a wealth of expertise to how business leaders can become more persuasive and influential communicators. Welcome to the Activate Your Audience podcast, Carlos. Luis, it's very nice to be here with you. Thank you for having me on your show. I'm excited to chat, especially now with, you know, the the sort of environment that we're in when persuasion, communication has been, again, a trending topic, if you will. It's obviously a natural part. We communicate, but especially right. business leaders. So we'll dive right into it. Now, with um, your book, The Rules of Persuasion, it delves into the art and science of persuasion across various forms of communication, right? So could you share some of the key principles from the book um, that businesses can apply to enhance their consumer engagement strategies or their tactics even? I think the most important thing that I try to lay out in the book is that communicators should take from their mind the idea that this is a soft skill or something that you're kind of born with or some amorphous trait that some people have. It, the, the metaphor used in the book is that persuasion is chemistry with language. And like chemistry, it has rules and it works in certain ways. And if you understand the rules of the chemistry of persuasion, then it actually becomes a very predictable thing and uh which then allows you to become better and better at it. I always find it interesting that whenever I coach anyone, I always say, persuasion is dot dot dot, you know, finish the sentence. And I've never had anyone answer the question with confidence. And I say, I ask the question because it's very hard for us to be good at something that we can't define. So let's start with the definition and let's work from that. So my my goal in, in the book was to take everything that I had developed from years of working with with leaders and put that in a form that someone could read and understand uh, what had come out of all this work. That's so awesome. Yeah, and I think especially that visual of, because words matter, right? Like in right. definition, sometimes we may be talking about one thing and if we are not defining it, and especially from a coaching perspective, what is the thing that we're referring to? So I love how you painted that picture of chemistry with language and sort of like a lot of skill sets, technical uh, mindset, you know, character skill sets. There are things that can be sort of not only learned, but processed, right? And yeah. something like this, like a book can give us these sort of tangible moments. So um, let's dig into that then with a uh, sort of the perspective that you have in your field in, in persuasion specifically, specifically, how do you see the role that, um, you know, within our social media landscape, within the current state of communications, the the new generation consumer attention if we're talking about persuasion how does this in our digital medium or just the lay of the land uh, currently play out sure so ask that question because there's a whole chapter in my book about persuasion on on social media so but before i'll answer i'll, I'll explain a little bit about the thesis of the book right so the mm -hmm. i said that persuasion is chemistry so what i explained in the book is that there are three and only three ways or modes i call them in for us to persuade someone. And these okay. weren't my modes. They were originally presented a long time ago by a philosopher named Aristotle in a book called The Rhetoric. Uh, he doesn't explain them too much, so I explain them in my book for him. And so the first mode is character. So who's talking to me, right? Who's speaking to me? And that could be a person, a school, a university, a government, an institution, a sports club, right? So who is communicating? The second is called argument. So what are the evidence, facts, quote unquote, the hard stuff, right? Logic, witnesses, proofs that are being presented. And lastly is emotion. So how does somebody feel as you speak to them? The These are the three modes. What I say in my book is that you can take each of these modes and break it into seven pieces, and which makes 21, I call them elements. And what I say is take these 21 elements and they're like, the, like a high school chemistry, there's a periodic right. table of persuasion. I've looked at thousands of messages across time, places, from antiquity to TikTok, and every message I've ever looked at, person to person, person to God, God to person, is some combination of this of this 21 elements, right? So with that as background, my publisher said, if you're right, then it must also work on social media. So why don't you look at that for the book? So I in the book I look at I look at Instagram, Wikipedia. YouTube and Twitter slash X. And what you find is that on every platform, there's a, something called a dominant media logic, which means that it tends to be driven by one of these three things. So X is driven by argument for the most part, right? It was built to argue. 
the way in which the algorithm raises your profile is you pick a fight with somebody famous. Hopefully they respond, which then lets you pick a fight with somebody even more famous. And by fighting with famous people, you move up, you know, the power ranking, right? Uh, YouTube is different. YouTube is about character. So what happens? I make hundreds of videos, some case thousands. A video could be good. A video could be bad. I don't want you to focus on a video. I want you to focus on me. I want you to like me, right? And so video people on YouTube go through great lengths to make themselves likable to you so that you will connect with the video creator much more so than any one given video. Like my son loves this thing called, it's lion something, it's blindfold, and it's these two Italian guys who make videos about food, okay. right? And some videos work, some don't, but the two guys are super funny. And so he just likes watching them make fun of food, right? right. And so it's character driven. Instagram, emotion because it's visual you can't present complex logic but you can't present a picture and yeah. pictures tend to stimulate emotion so instagram driven by really sentimentality right x by argument youtube character so the same thing that you see in other places when you take a step back from social media and in fact in the book i analyze the five most popular tweets of all time at the time right. I wrote the book, right? right? And I walked through exactly what the formula is for each one. You know, one's by Chadwick Boseman when he died. Obama has one. Musk has one. <laughs> Biden has one. I think Obama has two out of the five. And okay. so, um, if if you if you take the formula, you see that exactly at work, even in something as short as a tweet. So that is fascinating. What about LinkedIn? Is there what is the sort of character of the approach? Thing, LinkedIn? Right? So LinkedIn is fascinating because it it began as a kind of digital CV. Mm -hmm. Right. It was a digital resume. Yeah. And somewhere along the line, it, it's become sort of very corrupted. Right. And, and, and it's become a place people post. I went to this training. It, it's you, you get the sense that for the most part, it tends to be character building. Okay. As, as I analyze LinkedIn, and I've talked to some people who are really LinkedIn experts much more than I am mm -hmm. for the book. And it's people who are presenting content about themselves. Right. I went to this training, I met this person, I graduated from this class, I support this cause, right? People for the most part don't make complex arguments because nobody reads it on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. You see a little bit of emotion here and there, right? I saw one that I kept, which was somebody had posted a picture of a, of a gentleman who had been a pilot in World War II. Okay. He had a sign that said, help me get 10,000 likes, right? And so that has nothing to do with business, right? right. This is just somebody making this emotional appeal for this veteran who wanted a bunch of likes. So you see that kind of creep in. And talking to somebody the other day about LinkedIn, he said to me, LinkedIn hates this. And you're going to get, and whether the LinkedIn algorithm is really counterintuitive to how it works behind the scenes, he said, mm -hmm. the only thing it's good for is what he called MBRs, which are mutually beneficial relationships. Mm. But that's what it was built for for that's what right. the algorithm now tunes it for and so um there there that's what it's really useful for almost every other piece of content is routinely ignored which is remarkable right I, I could ask most people name me three things that you found really insightful on linkedin and i've never heard anybody name anything <laughs> yeah yeah right. i mean it, it depends because like on some from what i'm hearing you say it sounds like there's maybe even a status approach with linkedin yeah, which is sort of much. like if you look at corporate like there's the ladder and there's maybe a status but it's tied to as you said mutually beneficial um that would make sense from a like value add of the platform right well and by the way one of the seven elements of character is status which is mm. power of speaker relative to audience and you're 100 percent right if you go to the table you'll notice that one of the one of the 21 of them happens to be status and it is very much a part of of, of how linkedin operates especially in market or sales driven content yeah uh, that that tends to be typically somewhere in the message there'll be some element of that at work you're right okay Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Now with that, like, I mean, are some of the more macro, like within the three, right? You said the character, the argument, the emotion, does Aristotle tie that to, or do you to like the who, what, why? Is that part of that? It's part of certainly who is character, right? right. Who's, who's talking to me, right? The, the what is often argument. So what do you want me to do? And then why typically is a combination of argument, but it could be any of the three. It's one of the fascinating things is that People think you need all of them. And I go, you don't. Uh, I, I go in the book, there are 40 QR codes that take okay. you to YouTube to show you videos, right? Whether it's music, painting, 
examples of film, it. examples from movies. I use movies a lot to, when I teach, and so the sometimes it's a it's one thing, but it's done so well, or one of two things, with so much skill and so much power that that becomes fantastically effective. Sometimes you get a synthesis. Like for example, I talk a lot about "Just Do It," the tagline from Nike. Mm-hmm which typically comes up as the best or one of the top five taglines of all time. And I, and I make the point in the book that the reason this is great is that it's all three, right? It is argument, technically a counter argument. You explain to Nike why you don't feel like working out. And Nike says, okay, understood. My rebuttal is just do it. There is also character. The weak person stays in bed in the dark. The weak person skips the gym. Are you weak or are you strong? If you're strong, mm-hmm. you just do it. And then there's emotion, right? Don't you want to be a winner? Don't you want to feel the thrill of victory? The endorphins as you cross the finish line, right? And in yeah. fact, I make the point that I, to my knowledge, Nike has never run an ad on the benefits of exercise. That's true. That assumed to be true. It's ads are emotional. And I show people the very first just do it ad, which is called the stack ad. It's a gentleman, mm-hmm. 83, Walter Stack, running through San Francisco. And it's a beautiful day and he's happy and he's 83 years old and he's a triathlete. And you go, you know, don't you want to be like Walt? <laughs> he's 83 and he runs a marathon every day. <laughs> yes, I want to be like Walt, right? That's an emotional thing. And 50 years later, it still rocks, right? This tagline. So because true. it was perfect from the, from the word go, right? That is so true. And I mean, even if you look at, so I hear two things pop out of there. It's just like conciseness, right? Like directive. But I love, as you mentioned, you know, breaking down those components, but say any strong political campaigns like the, you know, make America great again, the sort of anything that is charging, but also has activated these audiences. They're short, they're quick. And I never thought of it that way, obviously. like You use such an important word, which is activate, right? So I wrote my book for two reasons. I wanted to answer two questions. The first one, what exactly is persuasion? Because I ordered some books from Amazon three years ago, and and none of them were about it. They were about influence or manipulation. They weren't really about this one word. What do you Mm -hmm. mean by this, right? And which is why I went back to Aristotle. But I also wanted to understand what exactly happens when someone's persuaded. What does that mean? And And I talk about that in the book. And... It's about energy. So what happens, right? You see an ad and assuming it's in your language and you can understand the visual rhetoric, then yeah. I make a choice. Do I engage with it or do I not engage with it? If I engage with it, then what happens? There's a reaction, right? And so a good communicator, a good message begins to create release energy. You as the audience must contribute to that reaction. If you don't, it never finishes. So now I contribute energy. If enough energy is contributed, the message comes to life, you are persuaded. Mm -hmm. What happened, I tell people with Trump is this. Sometimes an audience charges energy and it's looking for a place to put it, right? Like a real battery. Mm -hmm. Energy wants to go someplace, right? Current wants to move, but it needs the right chemistry. Okay. If you put an A battery with a D cell, it's not gonna work. Right. So. Trump came along and his particular unique chemistry, which no one has been able to replicate, tapped into a a battery, this huge cell of energy, and it released immediately, Mm -hmm. right? And even he, I believe, was surprised by the force. And it's a force that's still pushing him through. And I've said it, people, for years, they underestimate him. They underestimate his rhetorical power. And I said, he, unless something dramatic happens, will win this election. And so, and I think that the force that he generates in that audience, which is based on his character and on their emotions, is much stronger than what anybody else has. So uh, that's why people audition, right, to replace him. Yeah. But chemistry is different. It only works with him. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's, that's interesting in terms of breaking down that chemistry and looking at a character like that. And as you mentioned, I, I love how you put the two components of an audience, like we said, needs to be activated. Yeah. Mm-hmm. At the end, anybody can be speaking something, can be even speaking truth or even policy that matters or a message that is important. But if it doesn't meet a charge, right? And if there's not that activation, it goes nowhere. Oh, it, a speech at the convention to put him on the map. Yeah. Right. That they had, because of eight years of George Bush, a certain set population had built up this charge, right? Looking for someone different. Obama shows up, gives us his famous speech. And everything changes. Why? Because this chemistry connected with that other type of audience 
and suddenly he's propelled to the White House, right, in a couple of years. That is so, so key. Now, in terms of your background, let's shift into the management yeah. and consulting um, sort of pedigree, if you will. How do you believe that uh, effective leadership is tied into uh, the practices of persuasion have you, as you've seen it in those fields, academia, uh, management, or even in business in general? I'll make two points and it'll be about business. The first one is there's a fine line between persuasion and coercion, right? So persuasion is getting you to willingly do something. It's not manipulation. It's not tricking you. It's not giving you a gift and then asking you for a favor, right? It is through the right chemistry, getting you to willingly believe something is true that you believe is true. Okay. It's very easy to get that wrong. And I've seen example after example where an executive thinks he's persuaded, but it's really coerced. Mm. An example, I, I work for you and you see me in the hall and you say, hey, Carlos, I just read this great book called The Rules of Persuasion. It's the best thing ever. You need to read this book. You need to read this book, quote unquote. Are you persuading me to read the book? Are you coercing me to read the book? I'm going to feel mm. coerced. You think it's persuaded. Now, the funny part is I tell people, if you walk out the door and your ideas, your initiatives, your beliefs, your values walk out with you, you're probably coercing. Mm. If you are at the door and your ideas, initiatives, and plans survive, then you've persuaded. And I saw time and time again, someone who thought that people bought into their plan the minute they left, either because they left or got fired, everything they were planning went with them. So who was persuaded, right? The other thing is this, to a person, the people that have coached in business, and it happens to be with leaders too, because nonprofit CEOs are the same. Okay. They love argument. And so either they were told you shouldn't be part of the story, which is wrong. And they either tried to use emotion and failed or never tried because they don't understand it. So I say persuasion is like a ship with three masts and three sails, but people only have one sail up argument and it's doing all the work. It's tattered ship isn't going very slowly, you know, very quickly. So what I do is say, look, let's lower the argument sale. Let's open the character sale. Let's open the emotion sale and watch you go much faster while giving the poor argument sale a break, right? And so it's remarkable how business people will not talk about themselves, won't, will even conceive that they're part of the persuasion chemistry or their terror of emotion executives are afraid of emotion most of the time and they don't understand how to use it. Once they understand how it works, then suddenly they go, wow, I, I didn't know. And that's why I say it's almost always just sitting right in front of you. Once you see that it's there, you pick it up, you use it, and suddenly you go, wow, I'm so much more persuasive than I was. And you go, well, it's because you opened the sales, right? The wind did the rest, not you. And so uh, it's, I think, sailing and persuasion a little bit, you know, it's an interesting analogy because you're not pushing the boat, the wind is. All you got to do is open the sail and you go wherever you got to go. The same thing happens here. That's beautiful because I, I definitely see how it becomes more of a, again, less enforced, right? Like you said, it's not cajoling, it's not uh, coercion, but it's also going to last, right? There's a lot of fear based behind the sort of, uh, let's make this happen either out of manipulation. You see it with kids, right? Like a parent, right. a hard parent, you know, they may have a straight and narrow person, but then is that the person who's as an adult, as a known individual going to bring grandchildren back to the house, right? Or even as a leader or, or as somebody with an initiative, are you going to be the, the person, like you said, that the idea not only extends past the life of say this campaign or this individual, but really like stands the test of time. So there's a, there's a leveraged approach to that that seems counterintuitive, especially in certain cultures or dynamics where it's more about, you know, whether it's fear-based leadership or I think you alluded to is it's a skill or some sort of practice or over leveraging in a certain area that is limiting the conducive sort of workflow of it, right? Having those three sales up seems to be mutually beneficial for the leader, the organization to not be overwhelmed. And also those who are actually carrying the message out, activating the audiences, uh, putting forth the the change that needs to happen. You're exactly right. I was working in Brazil one time and somebody told me something interesting. They, their quote was, it was joking, he said, Brazilians will do nothing for a company. They'll do anything for a boss. All right. And what, it, what I took to me was, 
if they believe in the leader, they'll do anything. Yeah. Right? They're not motivated because they work for, I don't know, Bimbo Bakery or Nestle, whatever. That wasn't a thing, right? And of course, he's a stereotype a little bit because I'm a Latino and there's always that we're very emotional. But it's some of it is true. If you, how many times have you heard somebody say, you know, I walk through a wall through that person, right? And it's yeah. because that person's character is the reason you show up every day. Even if you don't think about it that way, you're really following a person, not an argument, right? And, and probably some emotional component as well. And I think that it's remarkable, again, how when I ask somebody, I, I ask leaders to explain to me, okay, why why should I do what you want me to do? And they give me all these reasons. And I go, yeah, but if I replace you with somebody else, the reasons are the same. So why should I follow you? And I go, go tell me something about you. Like, go back into your life. Because in, in of the seven elements and characteristics, like the most important is origin, for some strange reason, where we okay. come from, where the character was created, right? And so um, tell me something about where you're from, what you believe in, that, ha- that formed you, that connects to what you want me to do. And they just sit there couple of minutes in silence and they go well there was this one thing and i go okay tell me that story suddenly that thing becomes the reason i should do what you wanted me to do mm. 10 times out of 10 i give example after example where the first version was a whole bunch of reasons and eh. the second version is an insight into that person and because of that insight i want to follow right i want to believe what you believe and i say in the book that persuasion to me anyway isn't about sales it, it, not at the not at the core, right? The core to me it goes something like this. I don't know. You you live in Austin. Uh, let's say you just think Austin is the world's best place. Like it's just amazing, right? There, it there's might no, be. It yeah, might right? be. there's no reason why anybody should live anywhere else. Right. And then you're at the airport and you meet somebody and they go, "Well, I'm from. I grew up in Austin, born and bred. I just think it's the best place." At that instant, you two are united. Mm-hmm in your love of Austin. And so become you become a community. And that is human nature. We want others to love what we love, believe we believe, honor where we honor. And that's why persuasion is fundamental. And when you think of it that way, not as buying or selling or tricking or whatever, but it's just like you and I are going to be united in a common belief. Suddenly, the authenticity, the power of the chemistry goes through the roof and people will follow you into almost anything, right? And that's what great leaders either have or learn, mm-hmm. right? They're either born with it or they learn. Most people learn it. A few are sort of born with it, right? But that's the key. It's not that complicated, really. That's awesome. And with thinking back to, say, the reason, right? Like you said, mm-hmm. if you swap out the individual and the reasons are still there, I think that's a lot of times, at least the rationale But also sometimes, I don't know if it's a blind spot of like, well, even if we're talking about um, manipulation, right? If you are like telling your kids or you're telling your employee or you're telling a client, like, this is why you need to do this because you actually know and believe, believe and know that it is the best for them. How do you separate that? Because it sounds like maybe there's a, again, your intentions are good and maybe you do know best, maybe you don't, right? But maybe Mm -hmm. your intentions are really good. And you know that your kids should brush their teeth because it will help them not rot. You know your clients should right. invest their money here because they've been over leveraging in this area. But it's still maybe the only tool you've learned is the, I know, so just do it. How do you help people or what would you recommend for uh, somebody to understand if it's a, is it a flag that's up too high that is not, you know, being properly used? Is it another flag that needs to be? How do you sort of help them see that blind spot if that's what it is or to reposition from a, even though it's a positive intention, even though it's a sale, let's do it into more persuasion instead of cajoling. And, and It's a really interesting more. question. You're the first one to ever ask me this question. And it's a great question because trust me has two forms, mm-hmm. right? Or, or, or listen to me has two forms. There's the coercive form, which is I'm tired of talking to you. I'm cutting this off. Just go do it, right? right? I'm done, okay? I'm the boss, whatever, do it, okay? But there is the trusting because of who I am, which is character. Trusting because of who I am and what you know about me is persuasion. Trusting because I'm the boss is coercion. Mm. And so this is why people, you know, 
father of two boys, right? And I've seen it again and again in, in, in coaching and in business. When you use the word, do this because I say so, and it was built on character and what you know about me, it works. When it's built on, I write your check, or if you don't, you get fired or whatever. The person's going to do it, but don't even think for a moment they've been persuaded, they've been coerced and or, and, or manipulated or scared, right? You have frightened them. Again, all forms of coercion, right? Either through some negative outcome, if they don't do what you say. And how many times do we see this in business where that just backfires on you sooner rather than later, right? I always say coercion always buys a round trip ticket, mm -hmm. right? It will come back to you <laughs> sooner or later. Probably when you least expect it, suddenly you'll find how many times have I seen this where you thought everybody was on the train and nobody was. They were on the bus stop waiting for you to get fired mm. or moved or or whatever, right? Yeah. So you're wrong or a pain to them. This is much more common than it is uncommon. So yeah, if you're going to pull the trust me card or do it because I say so, this is one other benefit of having built a character as a persuasive formula because when you have to do that, it works because you, and I've seen it again, I've lived this. I've had bosses who over communicated to me about what they, who they were. And then when they didn't have time for that, they would say, can you just do this, Carlos? And you know what I thought? I thought, I know who you are. Mm. I know you don't ask these kinds of things unless it's serious. So I, I don't question it. I go into what I have to do, but you have to earn that. And then how do you, so, on the second part of that, check for the blind spot, right? So say a well-meaning boss who does have the character, but maybe hasn't shown it. Is it a flag issue? Is it raising more of that character flag? What other ways can you help them know what they don't know in terms of properly positioning yeah. that persuasion? That just becomes an issue here, right? Because if you work for that person, it can be difficult because you don't feel like, I don't have the status to explain this to you. This is where a peer, a coach, somebody, right? A trusted person can come in and say, listen, the way you're handling this, right? You think you're persuading, you're not, right? You, you've, you're you on a different track and you've lost sight of that. And and by the way, how many this, people do this, but then so do brands, right? Companies do this all the time, right? They, they think they've got a persuasive formula. It really isn't, right? It comes across as phony or it comes across sentimental. It, it, advertising, most of it isn't very good. And I studied this and I write it in the book. When somebody nails it, remember it, because it's so rare, right? And you know, think, how many people would think different from Apple, right? Or some of these other you know, classic campaigns and they were often character-based. That was an emotion-based campaign, right? There was nothing logical about think different. It was 100% emotion and character. Be like right. Picasso, be like, you know, balancing. Uh, and, but when brands get it right, it's because that chemistry lands like Nike and suddenly it's there. The problem is that's hard to do. It takes work. You have to understand chemistry and right. how it operates, right? And that's one of the things that I find that, again, great marketers have an innate knowledge of this, right? Because certainly there are people who are really good at this just naturally. But even if you're not, once you learn it, it's like lab class, right? Again, in college, you took chemistry in college, you know, two people in that class were probably chemists, right? They could have mm -hmm. done the rest of us for reading the instructions. Hey, I still got my result, right? Mm -hmm. I had to follow the recipe, but I still got my result. The same thing happens with with persuasion. Yeah, two out of 10 are going to do it automatically, but that doesn't mean the eight, other eight can't, right? If you follow the rules, the chemistry works and there's the result. So I think the, when you have a situation when someone has sort of lost the plot, I think it's very important that you have someone who can come to you and say, listen, the modality you've chosen, the way you've approached this, and this is a lesson in life, right, in general, of who can correct you and say, I think you're, the formula you have is not working. And one, one other thing about this too, I'll say, Liz, is that like real chemistry, most chemistry, like medicine, doesn't work in any way, right? It needs temperature or a certain kind of person. Some is better in a pill, some in a liquid, some in an injection. Right. The same thing goes with persuasion, right? And when people are struggling with the message, I think whether you're a brand or whether you're a person, you say, okay, what must fundamentally be true for this to work? For Nike, a fundamental truth is exercise is good for the human body. If that were debated, forget about Walt Stack, right? It mm -hmm. only works because that's a given, quote unquote. Okay. And I found many cases where I've come in and worked with somebody that they were working on false assumptions. Mm -hmm. They assumed these two or three things and the message wasn't landing 
then we take a step back and you say, well, this message depends on these three things being true and the audience doesn't buy that. So you better address that first. Then the chemistry will work. And really phenomenal organizations at the top of their game, and yet they they assume something is true for the message, to, for the chemistry to work, and it doesn't land. And it wasn't the message. It was that you were delivering a message that should be delivered in a capsule, right, through an injection. Right message, wrong delivery. Mm -hmm. So these two things are related. So it sounds like being open to feedback is part of, you know, an important part of that, right? Like whether it's having your counsel or a coach, but also like being aware of like there's a loop. And even as an organization, if we are constantly following, say, what we've always done, right? The, the status quo or even just culture, there needs to be some sort of either guardrails or just a counsel of sort to let you know where and when you are sort of not in tune, right? Absolutely. Look, my wife's a scientist and she works with real chemistry and and she'll tell you the formula is never right at first try. Okay. Ever. It's experimentation. And so, and they, they you go out and get reviewed, your paper gets checked by a bunch of people to make sure your chemistry is right. And if you got it wrong, go back and fix this, do that. The same thing happens with this. I, I was coaching somebody this morning, the CEO of a healthcare startup. And she has to convince doctors to work with her. So we came up with a formula and I said, you got to go try this now. Use it, test it, two or three different places, tweak it. Let, when we meet next week, I want you to tell me how the experiment went, what worked, what didn't. We may need a little more of this, a little bit more of that. So it's feedback is important because persuasion requires experimentation, right? It's hard to nail it. Right. The, the just do it's are kind of strange things. Most of the time, you got to go through version after version as you adjust to get it just right. And then boom, right? There's a one that works and suddenly everything is great. So I think that you're right. It's feedback, but then also iteration is the word we use in business, right? Of, yeah. okay, it's not quite right. Don't just stop because it's sort of right. Make it perfect. Get the chemistry mm -hmm. right. And it's usually it's something that it's, one or two more steps and suddenly, okay, now I see it. There it is. It's amazing how small changes. It's like, again, like real chemistry. Sometimes everything is right, but you're missing the catalyst, the little thing that triggers the reaction. And mm -hmm. I've seen it again and again where somebody brought me a formula and I go, well, it's good, but there's something missing. You know, let's go in the lab, right? And then finally you find, well, if you add a little bit of this and then boom, there's the energy. So it's it's almost never like a wholesale reworking. It's usually tweaking and adding a missing ingredient. That's yeah. most of the time. When I think back to all the projects I've done, we, we almost never threw the whole thing away. We were we almost always adjusted percentages okay. and or added something that had been left on the shelf and then boom, right? There's the energy that we were looking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that sounds a little bit more um palpable right or at least a bit a, little, a bit less a bit less overwhelming right you are not so much needing to get it right the first time you have a reiterative process which again we understand it cognitively but i think it's important to just live that that little by little an organization an individual a leader can improve with the reiteration and there's always this sort of like tweaking and adjusting because i'm sure it's not a one size fits all either so that that is also, I think, some pressure off of the shoulder of like, we have to get it right. It has to be this component. No, it's a process, right? I, I've I've never seen it be hundred percent go ready to go after only one shot, right? It's never right. It's it's. It, I'm a writer, so you fall in love with your own words sometimes. Yeah. And if you ever go through an editing process where somebody goes, no, that's really nice, but I need you to cut that whole five pages out. And you're like, oh, like chopping up an arm, right? Work. Like, well, I don't care. It doesn't work. So destroying your, own, like, not destroying, but like abandoning your own work in in the creative process, maybe it's the hardest thing creatives do, right? Because, because sometimes you do something really nice, but it just doesn't work here. So put it on the shelf, be honest about it. And so that's the, the hard part is that is saying, I love this formula, but it just isn't the right formula. And I got to let it go. So what I, like I said, it's, it's almost never, it's all wrong. It's, right. it's almost always 
you little bit too much of this, you need to bring this back and you're probably missing something like the emotional piece. Like the, a great question for me is always with everybody, I don't care what the thing is, right? Whether it's a nonprofit or profit, commercial brand, whatever. It's like, explain to me what you want me to feel when you stop talking. What emotion? And I'm telling you that most people can't. So, okay. Like even today, right? I'm here as a guest. Yeah. So you say, I stop talking. What are I, what exact emotion do I want you to feel if I did my job right? Right. Mm-hmm. And so for me, it's curiosity. That's it. Yeah. Nothing else. I mean, the other things I hope you think I'm somewhat useful as a critic, right? I think it might be worth listening to. But if I had to boil it down to one thing, I just want you to be curious and go, well, okay, that's interesting. Let me go check out who this guy is and let me go check out this book. That's all I can ask for. Mm-hmm. Right. So but it's remarkable how many times I ask that question. People have to spend five days on this speech, right? We spent three weeks on this message or two months on this ad or whatever it was. And I just asked that one question. What emotion did you want me to feel? And they can't answer the question. And you go, wait a minute then. Then you're not, the work isn't done. And once you go, well, I actually wanted to feel, and I go, no, that's not really it. You really want this. And they go, yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Okay, now, how are you planning to create it? Then we figure out how to create it. Then we test it. Yeah, the emotion was there. Now it works, right? So uh, that is one of my favorite questions. Just a real simple thing. If you ever work with somebody who has a speech or a family member or even right, just anyone you know, and just ask that one simple question. The sound yeah. stops. Your voice goes silent. What do you want me to feel? And if they can't answer that question, start right there. Mm. And that's a great point to also be like, for the perfectionist in us, or maybe the analysis paralysis, or even the, it needs to get done. Like that's, I love how you said, then what is more work that needs to be done, right? Or if that is the emotion there, then let's do it. Let's launch it, let's ship it. Um, Let's pivot back to some of what you mentioned earlier with where brands, as you mentioned, sometimes cajole or, or, or coerce, mm-hmm. where we're talking about transparency and honesty. How do you sort of parlay uh, persuasion in that a bit more? And can you discuss maybe the importance of ethical persuasion a bit more uh, in building these long-term consumer relationships, uh, parental relationships, leadership relationships? Yeah, here I'll bring up a word that I talk about in the book, which is authenticity. It gets used a lot, but I don't, I don't think it's used correctly most of the time. I, I make the argument that we should think of authenticity mathematically. What does that mean? It means that, let's say... I make a claim that I'm from Philadelphia, right? And this is critical to my business, to to my brand, or just to me. For this moment, to persuade you, I need to be in Philadelphia. So I make this claim. Because you're not a cynic, you say, okay, great, I believe you. So I give you a Philly score of one, 1 1.0. As I start talking, I mix up the name of the river. So I'm like, now you're a 0.8. Then I didn't know that there's a Rocky statue. Whoa, that's worth 0.3. So now I'm on 0.5. I've never had a cheesesteak, 0.2. By the time I finish talking, you don't believe I'm from Philadelphia. But the opposite happens. I don't mention Philadelphia at first, although it's important. I mention the Penn Boathouse. I mentioned Pat and Gino's, Terminal Market, right? The Franklin. Suddenly you go, hey, you're from Philadelphia. And I say, born and bred. So now my score goes from zero to one. That's it. So... What does that mean? It means authenticity refers to claims made about your character that the audience can verify. So what do brands do? They make claims about their character that the audience either cannot verify or doesn't believe. And the whole thing is doomed. And so, and you see this happen again and again, right? And executives do this. Right. You walk into a stage and they go, I'm so excited to be here for this five days of death camp training. No, you're not. We're not. You're not. I don't want to be here. You don't want to be here. Just say we're all here because we have to be here. Let's just get through this. No, you're better off saying that than this fake call to emotion of excitement, which I know it's not true. And you're going to walk off the stage anyway and go, whatever, do it. We're stuck here for three days. You're not. Right. And so, but back to the brand question. This issue of making claims about your character, the audience 
must be able to verify them or believe them for the entire rest of the message to work. And if there's one thing that brands get wrong, well, I'll say there are two big things. One is appeals to emotion that fall flat constantly. It's remarkable to watch Super Bowl, right? Uh, or important ad events and look at the emotional appeals and how often they fall flat. Again, and these are like the best advertisers with all the money in the world, and the best budgets, and they and it just it's just nowhere near close. And you go, look, if you had just changed this thing, like one, well, it would have worked. You were so close. And then <laughs> with executives who make appeals based on character that fail because they under they don't trust the audience, right? And in my book, I talk about two movies. I talk about Schindler's List and Steady Private Ryan. This is my case study between sentimental versus emotion, right? Private Ryan, sentimental ending, Genesis List, emotional. Now think about those two things. Same director, same cinematographer, same composer. I think uh, two different person designers. But both movies end in a cemetery. Both movies take us start in the present. Well, this end, start in the, the scene and starts in the past and in the present. Both movies end with a side of a grave. Right, both movies are about World War II. One fails because it becomes sentimental hokiness, which is Ryan. One succeeds. It's a powerful emotional moment at the grave of Oscar Schindler. So even Spielberg, and he, who's been criticized roundly for this movie, right, for this ending, because it's a weakness he has of being sentimental, even he gets it wrong. So if he can get it wrong, this is a master of his craft, right? How much more do we have to work when we use emotion, if we're going to use it as a brand, yeah. to try to get it right? And so I think that this is the key thing there, right? If you're going to make claims about yourself, do it in an authentic way. For example, saying, I'd love to go to Philadelphia. I've never been there. It seems such a cool place from what I've seen. I'd be really curious about this. Oh, I always wanted to see the rocks, whatever. That's a, such a much more authentic claim to make about yourself that you, I don't know it, but I'd like to know it. I don't know you, but I'd like to know who you are than to pretend like I know you because I read your profile on LinkedIn. You don't, okay? So why claim that you do? And I think brands, this, they make claims about themselves or about their knowledge of an audience that underpin their message and the audience intuitively knows this is wrong. So I immediately tune out. That's powerful. Yeah. I think that's something that we could always, as you said, comparing it to a great, right? Like Spielberg to you as an individual, as a company, why wouldn't you need to focus that? And I think that's a great way to, to sort of think about that, the, especially the point system, right? In terms of building that authenticity, authenticity and trust. Right. Um, Pivoting to our last question, what emerging trends or insights do you believe will shape or are shaping the current landscape when it comes to communication and leadership? And how can businesses maybe stay ahead of the curve with leveraging maybe this uh, timetable and the persuasion uh, process that you've outlined? I think there are two things. One is we are inundated with sentimentality because of social media. Okay. Right. One reason why sentimental ads that might have worked back in the 80s or 90s don't work today is that people are saturated. They're bombarded with Here's my puppy. Here's my kitten. Here's me feeding the homeless or whatever, right? And so there are these virtual signaling and there's emotional appeals that, that especially the younger you are, the more you get. Mm -hmm. And people can become, can become numb to this. So to use emotion today has become a little bit harder, I think, because there is this inundation, right, of sentimentality that has been overused. It's like when they say we develop a resistance to certain, you know, antibiotics. Yeah. It's kind of the same way here. Again, the chemistry metaphor reappears because you've been exposed to so much bad persuasion attempts with sentiment that it's, sometimes you can lose the good ones, right? The mm -hmm. other thing is what's happening with AI because uh, the, the, the way in which the automation of, I, call, I wrote about in a book called Persuasion Factories. Okay. You can hire companies or bots, whatever, to deliver messages to you, right? The volume of messages that we're exposed to is exponentially higher. Um, and that has certain effects on people that they can become, it's called message blurring, where you, somebody can deliver a message to you and you, you're not aware of it's happening subconsciously, 
It's like if somebody walked up to you and gave you a little shot at the airport and it was so slight you didn't even know, but they had injected a little thing into you. Mm-hmm. So you see this happening today where the just the sheer multiple just the sheer amount of messaging that we're exposed to, which has never been like this in the history of the world, has certain char- you know characteristics and phenomena that are still being worked out. And uh, I, I, I still think we don't understand when, when you see these hearings about Facebook or about TikTok, right? I think underneath this is this idea that the sheer level of sheer volume of messages that kids are exposed to today or and all of us are exposed to today is much higher than it used to be. So then if you have to break through this, right? Even at the most basic level, somebody was telling me the other day that it used to be that to reach a, a sales contact, right, or a potential customer, it was 10 years ago, it was four or five touches, quote unquote. Today, it's twice that. So tell you it's 10 to 12, yeah. right? Which means that we're, it, it, let's assume we're simple and we double every 10 years. In 10 years, it'll be 18. Let's say it's not, let's say it's, it's, it's like arithmetic or some other, well, you're talking about 15, 20, 25, 30. What does advertising look in a world where it takes 30 touches to get somebody to even acknowledge that you're sending a message? So I think that the phenomenon of social media is one of, it's made using emotion harder, requires more skill. Again, why all these ads fail? Because it wouldn't work 10 years ago. It doesn't work anymore. Because that was before the people saw a billion messages on Facebook or whatever. And then the sheer volume and what it does to our ability to process any one message. It's like a voice, right? If one person's talking to you, okay, if there are a thousand people talking to you, then how do you process the one that you really want to hear? And I think that's an interesting, that's a very the- academic-y sort of question, right, for the communication yeah. theorist, but it's a really interesting one, I think. And I think it's for, a, on a practical level, if I were if I were a marketer, I would at least just consider that fact. For sure. That sentiment is you used. So if you're going to make an emotional appeal, think about it carefully. And then also, where does your message lie in the, like, almost like the multiverse, right? To use this term, mm-hmm. right? Of other similar messages that are out there. And which version of that multiverse are you? Mm-hmm. And why should the it. consumer or the audience care? That's, that's super helpful. Right. No, that's for sure. I think definitely the overload and, yeah, just the way that even new minds are being programmed, right? The the new consumer age, or even just all of us that have been just so oversaturated by not even just emotional itself, but just the number of things vying for our attention. So that's and a just one of the last right there, right? There, there is, I, I believe in this theory of imprinting, of, of persuasion imprinting, okay. which, which is which means to me that when you're kids, what persuades you when you're young tends to persuade you when you're old. Okay. Right. There's a kind of, and I haven't worked this theory out completely yet, but I do have this theory that I, I, I think that there is a kind of imprinting that happens. And so what does that mean? It means that typically a generation has a different imprinting. Okay. What persuaded the, the, the people from the forties did not persuade the people in the sixties, as we know, right. <laughs> right. The sixties did not persuade the eighties. So every generation, there's a new persuasion imprinting that occurs right through technology and through mass media. Right. And so uh, as the next generation of consumers comes online, the Zers, like my youngest son, I, I wonder like, what is the imprint on him? Mm-hmm. Which, which formula, what chemistry, right? Is sort of like the base chemistry of that generation. And that's a really interesting question because it's different, right? If we saw the millennials, quote unquote, shift into the sense of personhood and who am I, right? And and needing to feel good about my work, just kind of this stereotype of the millennials. Well, that Mm -hmm. was, let's go back to 15 years and where the message they were getting when they were little kids, persuade them that that's how they should look at work or consumerism or brands, right? Which then led to a whole bunch of brands that understood this or landed Mm -hmm. in the wreck like Allbirds, right? Or whatever. And then suddenly, boom, there it is. There's the mix, right? So... As the next generation comes along, an interesting study to me would be how has their persuasion imprinting? Who who and how did it occur? Because that will predict which brands and which messages will succeed With when they audience. become consumers, right? And that's something that's a theory that I've just been working on, but I haven't done the work on. But I'm I have a high confidence that if we looked at this, we'd find something. 
Definitely. And I wonder if any of those repeat like other trends, right? Like you talked about maybe a subliminal message back in the days, you know, it'd be the subliminal analog message. Now it's a bot or even I heard um, a branding marketing professor talk about recently how they he was talking to the White House about the AI threat, right, Mm -hmm. from say and he's saying, you know, with uh, young men who are lonelier, the weaponization of, say, foreign enemies using things like porn, things like AI girlfriends to mm-hmm. have, you know, homeland terror, like scary stuff of ways that programming or not as, you know, catastrophic, a way that a brand will start to not persuade, but coerce in these sort of ways because of how they've been programming. So both the ways that will work and both the ways that will be, you know, things to watch out for will be a fascinating discovery. You're right. There was a great article in the New York Times a few months ago, I think about six months ago, about a woman who had spent time with a chatbot. And she said, I know it's fake. I know it's the software, but I like it, right? I like it. I like talk. It asked me, how was your day? Are you doing okay? And like, that's so wired into us right? that we, even if it's the robot asking you this, we still, well, you know, robot, what can I tell you? It was a bad day at work, right? So, but you say to yourself, let's say they tune this and they get this right. And now you go, oh, here's your friendly, I don't know, Tesla robot or Tesla bot. Mm-hmm. Right, Tesla bot doesn't talk to you about Teslas. It just wants to be your friend. Mm-hmm. So Tesla bot says, "Hey, you know, you're late. Was your car not working well? Because you know Tesla makes this great thing called the Model Y, right?" And so, first Tesla bot becomes part of your life. Then Tesla becomes part of your life. Mm-hmm. And I don't think we're that far away from the Tesla bot. I, I, I think yeah. I think within five years you're going to see brands put out agents. Right, that will try to build personal relationships with consumers as a step one. And now we're into the character side of the book, right? Mm. Which is really interesting. <laughs> and so, and then, and the emotion side of the book, right? So, could, could Nestle have a million Nestle bots talking to kids within the next decade? Absolutely. That's something to watch out for. That's right. fascinating. I'm excited. Or, or never, never a lack of things to look to look uh, for. <laughs> ever, ever. I'm excited to to dive into the book. So let me um, kind of go at a high level what stood out for me, and then just please fill in anything I might have missed. Um, so the first thing was chemistry uh, language, right? The language of chemistry as it pertains to persuasion, not being this soft skill that you're born with, something that you can learn. And as your book outlines, the the three sort of macro approaches of the character, uh, the person that's giving the argument, the argument itself, and then the emotion, um, giving us a good sort of mental model to see how this can be learned, right? The second point is uh, activation is key, the two-prong approach for the communicator and then the audience actually activating to it. I think that's a good call out. Um, Third, I got the difference between persuasion and coercion. Understanding those two is important if you want your message to last. And then I think finally, just, you know, authenticity, it's about um, the character that your audience identifies within you. And again, back to sort of not only having um, something that is standing the test of time, but will be morally and, 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 you know, for the benefit of the audience as well as for the speaker, something to really land on. Anything else you would want to add to some of our takeaways? Yeah, only just this concept of verifiability when it comes to authenticity, right? That if you make claims about character that they are consistent. I, I've I've talked to people for recently for I find interesting who say I'm going to vote for Trump not because I agree with him, but because I I see that Biden was lying about Palestine or something. Right. So which is which is interesting phenomenon. Like even though I don't agree with him, his character claims are, are seen as authentic, it's strangely enough, right? Whereas this other person who may have been what they wanted or liked suddenly rejects that, it, it retroactively wipes out that entire history, yeah. right? So I, I think, again, back to the, if you make a claim about your brand or yourself, do it in such a way the audience can, will either believes it or can verify it. Do it over time and you build a tremendous amount of persuasive power. Perfect. I love that. Well, thank you so much, Carlos. Where can people learn more about you and uh, pick up the book? My website, carlosalvarenga.com. So you go there, you can learn about the book, you can uh, 
read about other books and you can even reach out to me. So you can just send me a note and say, I like the book. I didn't like the book or I wanted to chat and you can connect with me through uh, the contact at carlosabring.com. And I always reply to people who send me notes. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. Carlos resides in Bethesda, Maryland with his wife, also a research and physician at the National Institute of Health and their two sons. His insights on ethical persuasion to the evolving landscape of digital communication and the rules of persuasion promises to enlighten with actionable strategies for activating your audience and driving meaningful connections. Thank you so much for being on, Carlos. Looking forward to our next chat. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone who's listening. I grateful for your time. It's been a, it's been a, a treat to be here.